Welcome to Woodland Community Church. Glad you could make it this morning. Uh, the Regeer family is going through some stomach bug issues, so we had to call an audible uh, late last night. So Pastor Mike will be preaching this morning, and I heard, Mr. I heard Tim giving him a hard time saying you should be ready to preach, pray, or die at a moment's notice. So that's Pastor Michael today. A uh, couple announcements. Just want to invite you all back to Christmas Eve service here at 6 o'clock, Christmas Eve, 6 p.m. on Friday night. And then uh, on Sunday, uh, we are calling it the Woodland Family Fireside Service. We are not all going to cram into the fireside room. That's not what that means, but the service will look a little different. I'm told there'll be lots of singing. And then each of the elders will be sharing a little bit about what they've been learning about Jesus this Christmas season. So it'll be singing, sharing. That's what Sunday morning, the 26th, will look like. Uh, tonight is the high school youth group uh, Christmas party. Uh, and there's an addition to that at 4.30. You can meet at the youth center and then going over to the, um, the nursing home to do some singing, some caroling. So 4.30, uh, singing, meet at the youth center at 4.30, and then... There is a soup supper that they're providing at the youth center for those kids, and they can stay into youth group then, uh, which starts at 6.30. So lots of opportunities there for the high schoolers tonight. My son asked what kind of soups there were going to be. Good soups. I heard the word bacon, and he said, that's it. I'll be there. Some kind of loaded potato soup. Okay. Um, I think I covered all of our announcements, and uh, Matt... No, the Sandovals are up next. Bear with us. <laughs> Guess there's no joy candle today. <laughs> Well, we'll just keep going then. <laughs> so today we see the first three candles of Advent, the Advent wreath be lit, the candles of hope, peace, and joy. Now we light the fourth candle of Advent. This is a candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a good time to love as Jesus loved us by giving us his most precious gift. And God is love. Let us be love also. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find these words. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. And from the Gospel of John, we hear these words from our Lord. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let us pray. 
Teach us to love, O Lord. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives. As we prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth, also fill our hearts with love for the world, that all may know your love and the one whom you have sent, your Son, our Savior. Amen. stand.
Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Todd Henderson, one of the elders here and a former youth pastor, so I can say with great confidence that, Michael, I'm glad you're the youth pastor today. <laughs> so uh, we'll be praying for you, and thanks for stepping up in Brian's absence. And let's do remember the Regeer family. As I know, uh, Brian's the one currently out, but they have uh, gone through a tough week as a family with sickness. And uh, let's remember them, and uh, hopefully they'll be healthy and be able to enjoy this week uh, coming up to Christmas. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a busy time for all of us, but let's uh, enjoy this time together that we have um, as a church family to come together and to worship and focus on what's important, and let's keep that in front of us this week as we um, look at celebrating uh, the Christmas and the coming of Christ this next weekend. So uh, if you would join me in prayer this morning, that would be great. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. Um, Lord, we acknowledge that we need you. Um, we acknowledge that we are broken, uh, sinful people, and that we have at times made a mess of um, the world that you've given us, um, of the, maybe the, just even the relationships, the um, place where you've put us, Lord, and we are grateful and thankful for you. Um, thank you for your um, example of love as Christ as he came, as he served, as he ministered to people and helped them, and as he loved others, and as he came to represent you to this world and show us um, the God that you are, that you are a God of love, that you are a God who is self-sacrificing, and that you are a giving God. And Lord, as we um, acknowledge our sin and repent of that and come to you and acknowledge what Christ did on the cross, dying for our sins, um, know that we can then have your love inside of us, that we can then turn and um, turn us around, that you can mend our broken, ugly hearts, uh, make them right with you, and that you can also then use us um, to share that love with others around us. So Lord, we pray um, as we celebrate this Advent season of your coming to this earth um, to save us and to live for us, that we would in turn do the same thing, that we would be your hands and feet, that we would represent you to this dying world around us that's going through difficult times, that are going through struggles. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would um, help us to live out the gospel, um, especially in this coming week and in just the uh, weeks and months to come, that we as a church family would be a real blessing to our community, um, to family members as we travel. And Lord, we just pray that as we go into dark, dark places where there's hurt, um, there's heartache, um, that we could uh, shine your light of your love and to people around us and help us be an encouragement to them. Lord, we just also um, want to lift up to you um, the Regeer family. We thank you for Brian and Amanda and their kids and how they um, serve and serve with joy here. And we just pray for their physical healing. And Lord, we also just pray for a real, just um, a time of spiritual and just emotional renewal and rest. So they've had a busy season being involved in the dinner theater and just other, I'm sure, Christmas activities, that we just pray your hand of blessing to be upon them. Um, Lord, we also just thank you for our missionaries that um, we um, support and that we encourage and that we pray for, that you would encourage them where they're at, as they, I'm sure, have faced numerous struggles with COVID and different travel restrictions and different things this year. We just pray that um, the Christmas gift that we send could be an encouragement, but um, also, Lord, that they would just take new encouragement and hope in you and the mission that you have for them um, where they're at, um, give them opportunities to, to love others and to share the gospel well. Um, Lord, may you bring encouragement to their lives if they've had a dark season of, of ministry or of, of trying times. And we just pray that they would see your hand at work and be encouraged and be blessed um, through you. Um, Lord, I also just pray for us as a church family that we would be able to find just some rest and peace during the season amidst the busyness, the hustle, and the bustle, that we would have times of refreshment and um, quiet times with you and have a new appreciation for the just this Advent season and the gospel and what you have done through that. Um, and Lord, I know Brian has mentioned this in the past, but I think as a church body, we also just pray for an end to the COVID pandemic, for the hurt, um, for the loss, the um, confusion that has brought on this world. Um, Lord, we know that there will be those that will be um, celebrating Christmas for the first time with the loss of a loved one, um, someone who's not there. And we just pray that you would draw close to them. Um, we pray, Lord, that as a church family, we can um, draw close to them as well and just put that loving arm around them, knowing that they are loved, that they are cared for, and that they are appreciated as children of you. And uh, lastly, Lord, I also want to lift up to you Brandy Schaefer and her family as she continues to, to battle cancer and has uh, just different struggles with that. We just uh, lift that up to you. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through that, um, even at times when it doesn't make, make sense that we um, struggle with the understanding of, of someone so young struggling through that with her young kids, and we just uh, lift them up to you and pray that you would uh, continue to work in and through that situation as well. So we give these things to you, Lord. Um, we ask that you would um, just be blessed by our worship this morning and that you would uh, send us away from here, just encouraged and with a new focus on you. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to have you sit for this next song. I'm going to share a song with you, and then we'll do some more singing together. <clears throat> so we just found out, you know, you know this last hour that Brian um, wouldn't be here, <clears throat> and uh, which is great. I'm excited for you, Michael. <laughs> He's ready. <clears throat> but uh, I had prepared some things Brian and I had been talking about. He was going to preach on uh, Jesus came to cast out fear. And some of you <clears throat> had attended the, the dinner theater this year, and the theme was about... Oh, I didn't. Thank you. <clears throat> theme was about fear, and um, and the crux of it was was to to never forget to fear the one that can cast fear away. And uh, a story that's alluded to, uh, highlighted in the at the end of the the play was um, when when the disciples and Jesus were out in the boat and the storm came. And uh, the disciples were afraid for their lives. Um, some scholars believe it was a spiritual storm because where they went was the, you know, the garrison demoniac, the man who was possessed by a legion of demons. <clears throat> so they're out in the storm and they, they wake Jesus up and said, do you care that we... You know, we're about to die, and Jesus came, and he, he spoke to the wind and the waves, and, he, and, and they all became calm. The storm was stilled. And uh, you think that they would have been comforted, but they looked at Jesus and said, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And it says they became terrified. So why, why would they be afraid? Well, not only were they amongst someone who was bigger and more powerful than even the elements and the spirits, but his goodness magnified all that was not good in them. And why did he come? He came to die so that he could forgive us from what we deserve. So nine years ago when I wrote the first rendition of this play, I rewrote it for this year, but I remember wrestling with how to, where to take this thing on fear. And this song, I was listening to the song on, on a trip by Michael Card that really began to hone, hone this in and uh, came back to my mind again this year. So I want to share this with you, and then we're going to do a couple more songs connected to that. <clears throat> A demonic shaking of the sea Black leagues of open water wide A legion of the darkest kind Lurking on the other side Hand outstretched against the gale A voice that stills the tempest roar As muzzled death is silenced there By he who calms the storm A great wind, a great calm, a great fear An unspeakable power is here Far beyond the darkness and the waves There is a very real reason to be afraid In the question rising from the flood Who is this man and what's this strength? The storms before his power still And the waters must obey A great wind, a great calm, a great fear 
in unspeakable power is here far beyond the darkness and waves there is a very real reason to be afraid Shivering in the heart of man Whose fearful faith is a facade Now safe from fear and dark despair To know the Son of God A great wind, a great calm, a great fear An unspeakable power is here Far beyond the darkness and the waves There is a very real reason to be afraid A great wind, a great calm, a great fear An unspeakable power is here Far beyond the darkness and the waves there is a very real reason to be afraid There is a very real reason to be afraid fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side My strength is in your name For oh, you alone can save You will deliver me Yours is the victory Whom shall I Faithful, you are faithful. 
Uh, children can be dismissed now to Children's Church, so if you've got kids in that age, I think it's uh, three through five or six years old, can head back to the fireside room. We also have nursery that is open throughout the service, so awesome. Well, another week that has taught me to stay on my feet, <laughs> be ready for anything, went from uh, having a uh, youth group and truth seekers that really could have been canceled, but we decided to keep going throughout the fog, and um, what, a, what a great night for those who did make it. Um, I assume everyone traveled safely for those who made it out for that, and, uh, and now I'm preaching this morning, <laughs> last minute, so uh, it's, a, it's a privilege, and I'm glad to be here. I had you know, for the most part, prepped a message, not Brian's message, it's completely different, 
Um, and uh, and but uh, we're just trusting that God's in it. He's going to be speaking through it, and this is the message that He wants us to hear this morning. So, um, more than normal, I'm going to need to ask the Lord to bless this message. So let's go ahead and ask the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time together, Lord. Um, we don't know the future. We don't know what to expect in the next hour, the next day, Lord, but you know the future. You hold it in your hands, Lord, and you lead us through it. And so we can take confidence knowing that um, you're in this, that you're here with us, that you are our help, our salvation, and that you are at work even when uh, we are caught off guard at times and have to kind of adjust real quickly to the, the change of plans, Lord. And so I just pray, Lord, that, um, that you would speak through me, Lord, that you'd speak through the message, and um, that uh, all of us together would be encouraged and strengthened so that um, this week that we, can, we just can carry this message where we go, Lord. And so I give this uh, service to you, ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so just like, you know, being ready to adjust last minute has been something that we've like all had to learn because of COVID this past year. I think another thing that everyone's universally learned from COVID is that our sense of smell and taste are important. Man, I remember getting COVID around this time last year, I think it was right before Thanksgiving, and I lost my smell, I lost my taste, and during the Thanksgiving holiday, I really didn't taste all that much, and I was hearing other people saying, oh yeah, haven't got my taste back yet, and it's been months, I'm like, okay, I, I handled Thanksgiving, but Christmas? No way. So I was, I was you know, I was nervous that I wasn't going to be able to taste the, the goodies at Christmas, smell the good scents, and fortunately, it, it came back, and I was able to enjoy Christmas to, the, to its fullest, but for some, even this year, I'm sure some are not going to be enjoying the full experience of Christmas because their, their senses have been dulled. Um, our, 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 our taste and especially our smell is important. Um, this, this little thing on our faces, whether we're proud of it or not, um, is important. Our sniffer allows us to recognize food that's been sitting out too long and we probably shouldn't touch it. Um, it allows us to recognize when a baby has had an accident in their diaper. When, when Melody had COVID just last month, our daughter, Araya, had a few diaper rashes because she couldn't smell if Araya had a dirty diaper. And so she sat in that poo for longer than she needed. She should have been sitting in it. So our smell is important. We need it. And it, and it, gives, it gives us a variety of sensations. For the candles that are lit, it, it's, like, it's, it's nice. But if we walk by that bathroom after someone exited, it's like, whoa, I'm going to stay away from that room. Um, we need our, our sense of smell, and today we're going to be talking about the importance of how we smell as Christians. Now you're thinking, what in the world? What are you talking? I'm not going to be talking about body odor. I work with youth, and I probably could spend all morning talking about body odor, but I'm not talking about our body odor this morning. We're going to be talking about how we are displaying and living out the gospel. So if you've got your Bibles, it's not going to be up here because I don't have any slides this morning, but we're going to be turning in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I had prepped, I had uh, preached this message back in Moody, like my, I think it was my junior year at Moody, and so and it was preached to a group of students who were going out into the ministry, and so I saw this message, I liked the illustrations, but there were some things that I needed to tweak a little bit, and so... Um, we're only going to look at three verses. We're in Second cha- uh, Corinthians chapter two, verses fourteen to sixteen. So, to let me set a little little foundation of what Paul is going to be teaching us this morning. Um, this letter is written to the church in Corinth, and um, he's writing this in preparation for his his second visit he's going to make in Corinth. And unfortunately, he's been hearing some uh, bad news about Corinth that the, the church there has really not been living out the gospel, living out the truth the way they should have been. Um, just like any other city, Corinth, the city of Corinth, was a, was a center of commerce, of cultural diversity, and immorality. And unfortunately, the church 
looked immoral in a lot of ways as well. And they were, they were having a struggling in following God. And so, so Paul is writing this letter saying, hey, I'm coming. Here's some things that need to be corrected. Let me give you some warning. Um, and I'm going to come and encourage you. Um, but then he, he goes into the section where he talks about his own ministry, how his ministry is authentic and is trustworthy and is reliable. And he begins by describing his ministry here in these verses. So let me read these three verses, and then we're going we're to talk about it a little bit here. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16 say, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient of these things? All right. So this this passage is full of imagery. Imagery that we really don't catch on to unless we knew the, the culture of that day. And, and Paul here is using a common illustration, a common picture uh, of, of a military parade. Um, he, he talks, he's, he's using a picture of, um, of, of a general coming back to the city after defeating his enemies, entering the city, and they would have this parade the whole city would come out. The streets would be lined with people cheering. You know, you could just see like confetti going in the air. And they'd be just shouting the praises of the general who had conquered their enemies. And as they made their way down the city streets, there would be, there would be shouts. There would be trumpets blowing. Uh, there would be incense burning. And the general would be leaving, leading a company of his soldiers. But also he would be leading the enemies king and anyone who decided not to surrender. And then they'd, they'd go to the center of the city, and there at the center of the city, the, the enemy's king would be executed with all those who didn't surrender. And this was a symbol that the, the victory had been won, there is a new order in charge, and that is the victorious general, and that the, the, the battle is done. And the soldiers got to go home and celebrate that they had won and they're home safely. And so this is the picture that Paul is using to describe his own ministry, his own following and calling of God. And so so we have in this three characters or elements that we're going to talk about this morning. First, we're going to be talking about the general. And the general is Jesus. He is our triumphant general who has won the battle. Paul, uh, the, Paul, Paul is saying that, that Jesus won salvation, but he is also winning our sanctification. Look at, again at verse 14. It says, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us, this is present tense, leads us in triumphal uh, procession. Paul is comfort, uh, comforted by the knowledge that Christ has won the battle and will always lead him into that same victory, no matter what happens. In the verses before this, he talks about his plans, how his plans had changed. But he was still confident that God was leading, that God was still in, that he was leading him in, into victory. And this is a pretty bold and surprising statement coming from Paul especially when we look at his ministry, at his life, which we have been in the book of Acts. And when we look at Paul's life, his ministry, we see that it wasn't full of victories. There was actually a lot of weak places and points in his life, a lot of hard things he went through. His ministry was not without hardship, struggle, and doubt. In fact, later in this letter that he writes, Paul boasts about all the weak points that he's experienced. Let me read from chapter 11, verses 24 to 27, where he says, this is Paul describing what he's gone through. He says, five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul's experienced it all. He's been out in the cold. He's been surrounded by danger by every side. And yet he says that Jesus, God, is always leading him in triumphant procession. Paul's ministry, his calling, has brought him through very difficult things. Yet Paul has confidence that God, even in the midst of the most difficult things, I mean, imagine getting stoned and getting getting beat up like he was, and yet he had confidence that he was still inside that that victory procession, that he was following the victor, Jesus. So like Paul, at times it might feel as though we are getting beat up, that our plans have been shipwrecked and we're surrounded by dangers from every side. But this first verse tells us that we can rejoice and have confidence even in the midst of struggle because Jesus is our victorious general who has won the victory of our salvation back at the cross and through the resurrection, but he has also promised to lead us through this difficult life and then reward us with our final reward in heaven. Our general has the victory. He is leading us into victory, and so we can have confidence even when this life looks grim at times. That's our first character. That's our first element of the illustration so we know who the general is, it's Jesus, but, but where is Paul? This is, he is describing his ministry. Where is he in the midst of this? Well, I believe Paul himself is and he's comparing himself and his ministry to the actual incense that was being burned as the procession went through the city. Look at, me, look, look at the verse with me again in verse 14. Paul says, And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ. So Paul is painting this picture of Jesus leading his soldiers and the captives through the town with incense burning and giving off this aroma, this smell, this strong smell everywhere they go. Paul is the incense, and the gospel message is this aroma that he is giving off. And it's interesting, when we look at this illustration, what we can learn from it. And so I thought I would um, try to light something and get this, uh, get this incense going. I was working earlier, I promise you. Um, when I was a young kid, I never really knew what incense was, because we always had candles, but... Incense was very common in Jesus' day, and it would, didn't look like this. It would, would have been in like this um, metal ball with the coals inside and the, all the herbs and stuff that would be smoldering, and they would have a chain, and the, the priests would kind of walk around waving it, and there'd be this smoke, and my smoke's gone out. <laughs> Illustrations, they either live by them or die by them. Um, Okay, come on now. All right, well, you can imagine it. (laughs) So they'd have this incense walking up. And what's interesting about incense is I, I see two things that stand out to me about incense. The first characteristic is that incense burns for a short time. Once it's lit, its time is short. I mean, the broad scheme of things, it's supposed to stay lit and... And then it's supposed to last for some time, but its time is limited. Um, it's, it's not going to burn forever. And that reminds me that our life is short. Our time here in this life is limited. We only have so much time. That's why we call it spending our time. It's not called, oh, I've earned my time, because we can't get any of it back. We are spending it. We only have today, and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Oh, I have smell now. You guys see that? That's cool. Um, it, we're, we're spending our time. Our time is limited. And, 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 and we're all spending it doing something or another. We all have different things. Whew, it's going right towards me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to smoke myself out. Um, 
We're, we're spending our time doing things, and we're called, what, what are we called to do and spend our time doing? Well, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, writes this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What is a sacrifice? It is something that is going to be killed. It's something that's going to be destroyed in order to bring God honor and glory. And so just like this, incense um, is burning, it is expending its life to be able to put out a fragrance. It ex- it's expending itself so we can smell something beautiful, something good. Our lives are not our own. They were bought with a price, as Paul has written in other places. The way we respond to the incredible gift of salvation is by living in obedience to God until we have completely poured ourselves out in service to him. The purpose of the incense is not to be stuffed in a drawer or it's never going to be lit and it's safe and sound. No, the purpose of it is to be lit on fire so that its life will bring out the fragrance that it is designed to bring out. It's of no use unless it's being burned up, expent, and used. The second characteristic, and this is, would have been nice if it was actually burning still, but, uh, is that it was supposed to put out a strong odor. I can smell it still, but uh, incense puts out odor. And as we are living for Christ, we too are supposed to be dispensing an odor, but our odor is not this kind of odor. It's the gospel message that we're supposed to be dispensing as we live. And and Paul says that God will spread this fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere through us in these verses. We are the bearers of the strong aroma of the gospel, We're to be displaying this gospel wherever we go, through our actions, through our words, through the way that we use our treasures, through the way that we make decisions, through the way that we spend our time, through the way that we interact with our neighbors. All that is supposed to be a display of the gospel. Paul was not exercising his faith and love of God behind closed doors. No, he was out in the midst of other people so that they can smell and pick up the gospel, as he lived it out. The gospel is to be evident through the way we live our lives, both in public and in private. So these two characteristics, that that incense is supposed to be expent, it's supposed to burn up, and it's supposed to give out a fragrance, remind us that the goal of our lives is to give Jesus our all, everything we have, so that through us, the message of the gospel can be carried throughout the world. We're going to come back to that in a little bit, but let me go on to our third element, the third character piece of this illustration, and that was the people that were behind the general. In this illustration, uh, and at that time, as, as I said earlier, the general had been leading two groups of people. He would have had the soldiers behind him, and then behind the soldiers would have been the defeated king and, and all those who did not put up the white flag and said, no way, I'm going to go down with, with my king who was defeated. And so we have these two groups, and, then, and they were being led through the city with, the, with this, this incense filling the air, people shouting and cheering. And, and the incense that was burning, that smell, would have been received in two completely different ways. For one group, the soldiers, that smell the incense meant, hey, I'm almost home. I'm almost there. The victory is secured. I'm in my, I'm I'm here. Once I get down to the middle of the city, I'm going to go see my family. I'm going to live in peace under the, the strong, the good commander that I followed into battle. And so that incense, that smell would have been the smell of hope, of comfort, of joy. But to others... The captives, the king and those who didn't surrender, that same smell would have meant something completely different. They would have been marching down the city thinking, this is the end. This is how I go out. And it would have been the smell of judgment because they knew once they got to the city, their time was done and they would be executed. This is why Paul says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. 
You see, the gospel, this, 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 this message that we're putting out, is a powerful and heavy message. That's why Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? The gospel is a big thing. It's a powerful message. And for those who have it, have great responsibility because it is the power of salvation. For those who receive it, the gospel means life. But those who reject it, the gospel means death. So in the same message, it's either bringing life or it's bringing condemnation. Paul has no control over how people respond to this gospel, but he knows that he must carry it wherever he goes and that his message has great weight. And there's, so, so there's, two, there's, two, there's two results of our display of the gospel that Paul is showing us. One, some may reject our message. We're going to experience people in our lives who are going to reject us in some way. But we can take courage knowing that if they're rejecting us because we're faithfully following Jesus, they're not really rejecting us. It's not a personal attack. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the gospel. And instead of getting frustrated and angry at them, we're to show them compassion and mercy and pity them because their ears are not being opened to the gospel. And we should be praying for them. But the other side of the coin, if we're living out the gospel through our lives, our message will bring life to those who hear it and receive it. And what greater use of our lives than to be used of God to bring that message of life to those around us. And so we can have the hope and the prayer that it will fall on open ears and open hearts. So the point that Paul is making and what I want to share with you this morning is simply this. Let us be smelly Christians. Let's be smelly Christians. Our smell is going to be received in different ways. If we're, if we're really truly following Jesus, we're living out our faith, it's going to be received in different ways. It's kind of like uh, the smell of fresh cut vegetables that were pulled from the garden. For the gardener, it's as rewarding and like rich and, oh, can't wait to consume these vegetables. For the small child, it means doom. It means I, I got to sit through a long and hard, difficult supper to get this stuff down, right? Two completely different responses. If we're living for Christ, if we're following him through our words and our deeds, we're gonna be, we're, people are going to interact and respond to that in different ways. But I think the problem is that many Christians in our, in our culture and around the world have either lost their smell or they're hiding their smell. For some, their smell has gone out, kind of like mine here. They're, they're no longer emitting the gospel. They've lost, lost the fragrance that had, that had started at one point, but because of certain things, whether it's difficulties, maybe it's struggle, maybe it's questions and doubts that you're just not finding answered, maybe it's just a fear of, of people rejecting you, you're, it's, it's gone out. And we no longer are putting out this, this aroma that's supposed to, supposed to cause a reaction. This gospel that's supposed to create in people either great joy or frustration at times. Our fire has gone out. And, 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 and we're, not, we're not displaying it. For others, I think they're, they're hiding it. They allow it to be lit at church on Sunday mornings, maybe Wednesday nights, maybe at small group, but as soon as they walk into the workforce, as soon as they go to a family holiday where bunch of people don't know the gospel, they kind of put, put a cover over it, make sure that people don't smell too much the gospel that they're supposed to be carrying out, and so they hide it, so they can, they can seem like they fit in more. I think that those are two of the biggest struggles that we have as Christians, two great fears that we have in being a smelly Christian. But let's, let's learn from the deep the, the theological words of the children's song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush, oh no, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, no, I'm going to let it shine. In the same way, we have an aroma to be giving off as we live life. Our aroma can be sniffed out. Our aroma can be hidden, but God desires that we live in such a way that our aroma is being spread to everyone around us. For some, it's going to be encouragement. For others, it might mean judgment because they're rejecting it. 
He is leading us. Remember this. It is scary to live out the gospel, to be potent in your places that God has put you. But remember, who's got the victory? Jesus. Are you going to be led through difficult things? Yes. But the victory is ours in Christ, and we can have confidence and boldness as we carry the gospel. So let me leave you with this encouragement. During this Christmas season, may the gospel message that you carry be the strongest smell of the holidays that those around you experience, whether it be a foul smell for some or a sweet smell to others, just as long as you're spreading the aroma of Christ wherever you go. Let's all be smelly Christians. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these words, this illustration that so beautifully displays our need to carry the gospel and and be excited and really display it in our lives, Lord. Whether that be with our children at home, our coworkers, whether that be our neighbors, uh, 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 parents of of, of our kids, uh, a friend's kids, um, and other, other people that we're interacting with, Lord, We just pray that you give us boldness, give us confidence to live out the gospel, to fill us with your love and your spirit each day so that as we live, as we carry on and follow you, Lord, that those around us would experience the aroma of Christ and that they would see, and our greatest hope is that they would see and taste that you are good and that that you are loving and that there is hope when they they bend their knees and call upon you um, in faith, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask that you would, you would lead us and help us in these ways. Um, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand. <clears throat> As we think of the, this gospel that uh, often we, times we think we don't measure up, we're not worthy, and we aren't. But... Uh, It's not about us. We fix our eyes on Jesus, not ourselves. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we claim his mercy.
sins they are many his mercy is for joining us this morning. You are always welcome to stick around and enjoy some fellowship, enjoy some time together. We will have Sunday school starting at 1030 for kids in here, adults in the back, and then youth downstairs. Next two, after this week, we'll have a two-week break from Sunday school. And of course, you're invited to our Christmas Eve service as well, so we'd love to see you here on Friday night. Let me leave with you with this exhortation from Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Go in peace.